Okay, welcome to this virtual video tour. Today we're in Pimai, Nakhon Rach Sima. So we're at uh, Prasat Hin, Pimai. Okay, so this is a, a monument which was built by the Khmer people in the 11th or 12th century uh, CE. Remember that uh, this area of Thailand, Isan, as well as um, Lopuri or Lawo region, were provinces of the Khmer Empire. Now, what's really interesting is uh, if you look down here, you can see that um, all of the gateways are lined up. The gateways or doorways are lined up. And if we look this way, um, this is actually a part of the ancient Khmer Highway, which went all the way to Angkor. Okay, so this, um, I guess you can call it this hole or this, this entrance, um, points in the direction of Angkor, or the capital of the Khmer Empire. And that, uh, where you see those people standing, was actually part of the ancient Khmer Highway. So, um, in regards to the materials that were used to build this monument, we've got a lot of sandstone that was used. Sandstone was used here for, for the railings, as you can see. Okay. Sandstone was used for the doorways. We had two different types of sandstone. We've got white sandstone and red sandstone there. These naga or payanak were also carved out of sandstone. Okay, like you can see. All right, I'm standing on some sandstone blocks right now. Here you go. You can see the two different uh, types of sandstone. And although this has been worn by the weather, uh, you can see that. They are quite decorative, so it would have taken some very skilled artisans to to uh, carve these. And you see just how well these blocks fit together. Quite, they fit together quite nicely, quite beautifully. So again, um, the Khmer people were very good engineers and mathematicians. So if they were able to. engineer this type of uh, structure. See just how well these fit together. Now obviously this was reconstructed. That is at one point uh, many of these blocks were scattered all over the uh, ground here and people in, in recent years uh, put the temple back together but this is the way it would have been done in the past of course as well. See the detail there. Sandstone frame on that window. And again, you can see uh, that all these doorways are lined up. If you look in this direction, going towards Angkor. And again, this was a religious structure uh, built in the 11th or 12th century with some uh, added. There were some structures added to the complex again in the 13th century. So it wasn't built all at one time. This wooden floor, of course, uh, is modern. <laughs> I guess that goes without saying. No. Sandstone was not the only material used to build this monument. There's also laterite that was used. Laterite, of course, is a cheaper material. So if you look at these three prongs right here, it's very reminiscent of uh, Angkor Wat. And the three prongs 
likely would have represented the uh, Hindu trinity. Uh, one of these prongs is actually constructed entirely of, of laterite, this one over here. Uh, and that one we're looking at right now is the one that housed an image of Jayavarman the seventh. Now, this structure probably at one point was a Hindu monument, but it was also, uh, at least during the reign of Jayavarman the seventh, uh, converted to a Buddhist monument. Okay. So let's going through here. Let me just give you a panoramic view. It's hard to see with the sun. See that these pools were man-made. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they probably would have contained water. And remember that water uh, was uh, used for both spiritual and practical purposes uh, in the Khmer Kingdom. Remember that uh, the island on which Mount Maru stands was of course surrounded by water and most of the temples built by the Khmer were uh, made to represent Mount Maru so the water would have represented the ocean surrounding uh, the island on which Mount Maru stood. Okay, see this little description here, let me read it out loud for you. It says, uh, this hole, I should probably say these holes, were made to contain auspicious objects or important or religious spiritual objects. When the temple was constructed, the offerings consist of clouded <coughs> gold leaf, um, eight petaled lotuses, as well as quartz and rubies. Uh, they are now displayed at the Piedmont National Museum. And let's continue to walk through here. And interestingly, we have a new ancient stone inscription here. Okay, which would have been written in the ancient home language used by the Khmer people. Okay, again, you can see the two different types of sandstone that were used: the, the red and the white sandstone here. This prong also was constructed of, of sandstone, whereas this one would have been um, constructed of laterite. So let's get a closer look at the laterite. It's a cheaper material, more easily found, and uh, easier to form into blocks. So you just sort of had to shape it and let it sun dry. some sandstone blocks mixed in there. Inside this prong we've got a, an image of Jayavarman the seventh. But the one that's actually located in here right now at present is a, um, a reproduction. The real one is in the um, Pimai National Museum, which is quite close to the, the actual ruins. of Jayavarman the seventh uh, in the posture of a bodhisattva. Again, this is a reproduction. The real one is in the in my National Museum. Not too far from here. All right. Okay, we've got some beautiful uh, carvings here. It would have taken master artisans to be able to carve this so precisely. Let me just let, let you get a look at uh, the top of this. It's very beautiful here. 
like an image of a, a dancer, actually. Not sure which which god or deity it's supposed to be, but shows him in a dancing posture, which probably points to uh, some of the cultural dances of the ancient Khmer people. A tradition which is uh, carried on until today in Khmer society. I know, as I said, this temple was, at one point at least, a Buddhist temple. So we do have a um, statue of the Buddha surrounded by <coughs> Seven-headed Naga here, or covered by the seven-headed Naga. This one, I believe, is also a reproduction. But interestingly, it's seated on a stone yoni. So originally, there probably would have been a, a Shiva Linga here, which, of course, represents Shiva, one of the Hindu gods. So, you know, at one point, this temple was a Hindu temple. At one point, it was a Buddhist temple. It really depended on what religion the monarch or the king of Cambodia followed. And again, King Jayavarman the second, sorry, King Jayavarman the seventh, was a kind of the quintessential Buddhist monarch. So during his reign. Um, the official religion of the Khmer Empire was Buddhism. But, of course, again, we have a stone yoni here, which I believe to be original. And uh, there would have been a Shiva Linga situated on top of the yoni, which, once again, uh, is a Hindu symbol, and the uh, Shiva Linga would have represented uh, also the king at the time, who some Khmer kings seen themselves as actually um, reincarnations of or, or incarnations of the, the god Shiva, or sometimes the god Vishnu, okay, because they consider themselves to be God kings or um, Deva Raja, whereas Jayavarman II would have considered himself a like Dharma Raja or a king which exemplified, exemplified the uh, the Dharma, which stood for the three Buddhist principles. That looks. Dangerous and terrifying. Okay. Let's get another look at the beautiful artistry here represented in these uh, stone carvings. I'm trying to focus my camera a little bit better. There we go. And again, you can see the dancing figure in the center. Which probably gives us a little bit of idea of the dance style of the Khmer people, um, which is called Apsara, a type of dance which is still practiced in Cambodia today. Some more dancing figures. Presenting the Apsara dance. Well, I'm going to end our virtual tour right there. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for listening.